At any given time, there are over 50,000 ships operating across the world's oceans. You can track them moving on online maps, see them out at sea, and find them all over social media and websites. Container ships are everywhere in Europe, North and South America, and Asia. But if you use a filter to show only the ultra-large container ships that can carry up to 24,000 containers, the equivalent of an entire small town, you'll notice something. Not Antarctica, not the Arctic Ocean, it's the United States. Why is the world's number one superpower left out of the roots of the largest, most advanced ships on the planet? The answer may surprise you. Let's get started. Do you know when containers first appeared? The story begins in 1956, when an American truck driver named Malcolm McLean got tired of loading and unloading bulky cargo piece by piece. He thought, why not put everything into a sealed box and load it straight onto the ship? And so, the Ideal X, the very first container ship, left the port of New Jersey for Houston, carrying 58 containers. Since then, the world has been in a non-stop race to get bigger. Ships that once carried 500 containers grew to 2,000, then 10,000. And now the numbers are almost impossible to keep track of. This revolution started with Americans and was born in the United States. But in just two decades, the center of containerization shifted to Asia. Yes, halfway around the world, while China, South Korea, and Singapore were building deep water ports and massive shipyards, American ports were still operating like it was the 1960s. Old cranes, shallow docks, and small scale. Remember the Panama Canal? 70% of the goods passing through the canal are going to or from the United States. But when it was first built, it was pretty small. So for decades, every ship had to shrink to fit the Panamax size. About 965 feet long, 106 feet wide, and 39 feet deep. That size didn't just shape cargo ships, but also cruise ships and naval designs. Then, in 2016, the canal was expanded to the Neo Panamax size, 1,200 feet long, 161 feet wide, and 49 feet deep, big enough for ships carrying 20,000 containers. The world celebrated the new era of mega ships. But most American ports didn't. To help you picture it, think of the global trade map as a giant transportation network. In Europe, intersections like Rotterdam, Hamburg, or Felixstowe can welcome ships carrying up to 24,000 containers. In Asia, ports like Shanghai, Busan, and Singapore operate day and night, handling over 40 million containers a year almost three times the total of the entire U.S. West Coast. And in the United States? The two largest ports, Los Angeles and Long Beach, together only handle about 17 million containers a year. Sounds like a lot, right? But to put it in perspective, the port of Shanghai alone handles as much cargo as the top 10 U.S. ports combined. But what if we tried to bring those mega container ships to the United States? The answer isn't simple. Unlike Asia or Europe, where ports like Rotterdam, Busan, or Singapore are right on deep water, most major U.S. ports are built at river mouths. Savannah, New York, Houston, Charleston. This used to be an advantage, making it easy to connect goods to railroads and highways. But with ships nearly 1,300 feet long, it's now a nightmare. That's because river mouths are where silt builds up quickly so the average depth is only about 40 to 46 feet, while today's megaships need at least 52 to 56 feet of draft to avoid running aground. To keep that depth, the United States has to spend a lot of money every year, sometimes hundreds of millions of dollars or more, on constant dredging, which brings heavy environmental consequences. Muddy water, bottom-dwelling creatures sucked up with the sand and mass fish and shrimp deaths. For example, the project to dredge the port of Savannah from 40 to 48 feet cost $973 million and took eight years to complete. Yet it's still not deep enough for monsters like the Ever Ace. Nearly a billion dollars 
just to welcome a few extra ships a year. A luxury investment that even maritime experts sigh about. Is it really worth it? Even if the ship makes it in, the real problem is on land. Cranes at U.S. ports can only reach about 180 to 200 feet, while the newest container ships are up to 246 feet wide. Many big ports like Los Angeles, Oakland, or Seattle still use semi-automated control systems that date back to the last century. Meanwhile, across the Pacific, places like Rotterdam in the Netherlands or Singapore's Tuas Megaport look like they're from the future. No horns, no shouting, just self-driving robots moving like ants, robotic arms unloading over 180 containers per hour, working 24 hours a day, seven days a week with Swiss watch precision. If docking at an American port is a math problem, it's a tough and expensive one. The average cost to unload a container in Los Angeles is $500 to $600, three times higher than in Shanghai, where it's only about $150. And that's not all. Just the security inspection fee can be up to $300 per container, plus storage fees, truck appointment fees, wharf fees, in total, every container entering the United States costs $700 to $900 more than if it landed in Rotterdam. On top of that, the difference in operating costs between a 20,000 and a 23,000 TEU ship is only about 1% in fuel, while upgrading a port can cost over $100 billion. One grounding incident, like the Ever Given in 2021, cost the whole industry $9.6 billion a day, and no shipping company wants to risk that on U.S. shores. So most companies choose the safer option, 10,000 to 15,000 TEU ships. Smaller, more flexible, less risky. And there's more. The U.S. administrative system is like a maze of paperwork. A port expansion project has to go through the Army Corps of Engineers, dozens of environmental reviews, and even community votes. The not-in-my-backyard effect means locals protest any project near their homes. The dredging project at Charleston took 13 years just to get approved, while a similar project in Oakland was canceled because people were worried tall cranes would ruin the view and affect migrating birds. Suppose the ship does dock. The journey isn't easy after that. Cargo arriving in Los Angeles has to travel 1,900 miles to reach Chicago, while goods from Rotterdam only need to go 310 miles to reach 70% of Western Europe's population. A container from Shanghai to Los Angeles costs about $1,000 for ocean freight, but just the trip from Los Angeles to New York can cost another $3,000. The United States has over 300 commercial ports, but none are big enough to serve as a mega transshipment hub like Rotterdam or Singapore. Instead of funneling everything through one giant distribution center, goods have to move through a massive network of trucks and trains, crossing the country over thousands of miles. And then, there's one more factor no engineer can control, the weather. The Pacific Ocean, the main shipping route between the United States and Asia, is not only vast, but also the roughest on Earth. With ships over 1,300 feet long, they're more likely to experience parametric rolling when waves match the ship's natural frequency, causing violent rocking and even breaking the ship's back. In 2020, Typhoon Malave caused the Maersk Essen to lose 750 containers in the ocean, over $37 million in damages. A year later, the one Apuse lost 1,816 containers, the equivalent of a skyscraper collapsing into the sea. Even after surviving rough seas, megaships face another enemy, bridges. And this is where the decline of America's maritime empire begins. When the Bayonne Bridge in New Jersey was still a bottleneck, any ship larger than 16,000 TEU had to turn around. Americans had to spend $1.7 billion just to raise the bridge. In return, they welcomed a few of the first megaships and thought they'd caught up with the world. But just a few years later, in March 2024, a collision between a mid-sized cargo ship 
and the Francis Scott Key Bridge in Baltimore shocked the world. The bridge collapsed completely, cutting off one of the most important trade routes on the East Coast. A nation that once taught the world how to ship goods faster, cheaper, and more efficiently, now has to wait in line for the very ships it inspired. Even though the United States accounts for nearly 40% of global consumer demand, most containers headed for America still have to be transshipped through Asia or the Panama Canal before making their way inland. Every detour means thousands more miles, extra days of delay, and millions of dollars in added logistics costs each week. Remember 2021 when the world fell into a supply chain nightmare? Over 100 container ships had to anchor off Los Angeles and Long Beach, lined up like a giant steel necklace across the Pacific. Goods from TVs and phones to baby formula were all stuck. For weeks, the entire U.S. West Coast turned into the world's biggest parking lot for ships. Locals in Los Angeles joked, but it was true. We don't see sunsets anymore, just containers. Every ship waiting offshore still had to run its diesel engines to keep the power on. And with hundreds of ships like that, the skies over Los Angeles turned gray. That year alone, the area breathed in over 100 tons of toxic smoke every day. The same as if 500,000 cars were running non-stop. While America is still struggling with old bridges and cramped ports, Europe and Asia are speeding ahead, sprinting into a whole new era of shipping. While Los Angeles has to wait 10 years just to get dredging permits, across the Atlantic, the United Kingdom has already finished London Gateway, a $2 billion state-of-the-art port that can handle seven giant Triple E ships at once. There, robots work around the clock. No breaks, no strikes. At Rotterdam, the heart of European shipping, Automated cranes run 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and driverless vehicles move containers with split-second accuracy, twice the efficiency of Los Angeles. Imagine this. In the United States, workers still have to wear hard hats under the sun, manually controlling cranes. In Rotterdam, the whole port runs like a giant Swiss watch. No horns, no shouting. Just blue LED lights reflecting off thousands of containers sliding past each other like blood in the veins of globalization. In Asia, the game has gone even further. Singapore and Shanghai have turned their ports into national symbols, where every square foot is planned for maximum productivity. Singapore's Tuas Megaport is 66 feet deep, can handle up to 200 containers per hour, and by 2040, will process over 65 million TEUs a year, three times the total capacity of the entire U.S. West Coast. These countries treat ports as strategic national assets invested in and operated by the government, instead of splitting up management among private companies like in the United States. In Europe, they're not afraid of big ships. They just build bigger ports. And China, a country that once learned from America now leads the race. In 2025, they'll launch the Green Sea Lion, the world's largest container ship, able to carry 27,500 TEUs, 27,500 steel boxes like Malcolm McLean once dreamed of. It runs on LNG fuel and shore power, cuts emissions by 30%, and its hull is so efficient, it can save 15% on fuel compared to regular ships. But here's the thing, this ship will never call at a U.S. port. It's designed only for the Asia-Europe route. Docking at deep ports like Rotterdam, Hamburg, or Singapore, where the channel is over 60 feet deep and cranes can reach the 24th row on deck. And so, the United States, the world's biggest import market, can't welcome the world's biggest container ships. What do you think? Can America once again rise to rule the seas? Or will it just stand on the shore, watching the world pass by on the very ships it invented? Share your answer in the comments below. If you enjoy stories like this, hit subscribe.
because this is just the beginning of our journey to explore the real world.